the artificial intelligence model that we use, it creates sounds that nobody has ever heard before. The new instrument itself is a deformable, non-rigid instrument. And you can actually physically modify, change the form of the material. And that material is the musical instrument, so that the amount of uh, pressure that you apply, the form that you create, that actually results in uh, developing different sounds. Important part here is where we apply the artificial intelligence, that the sound synthesis is always brings you uh, unusual sounds. Uh, in a way that you start playing an instrument with a particular sound, but when you take your hand away from the instrument, then it generates a totally new sound. Uh, this has been always our intention from the beginning to look into the digital technologies and their particular role in artistic practices. What I find interesting in it is kind of using it as a, as a tool, as a support for your own creativity in using machine learning and deep learning to uh, find connections between points that you hadn't uh, thought of and like merging things. My music making process is always a kind of dialogue and interaction with the tools and the machine learning I find provides an interesting twist on that where we can make the tools maybe more autonomous. Some would say intelligent, I maybe hesitate to call it that at this point. Well, we don't do guitar but we look into artificial intelligence tools for example and they shape our relationship with our uh, current musical instruments and uh, the music that we intend to make. I'm Koray Tayrolu, I'm an Academy Research Fellow in Aalto University School of Arts and I'm also leading the research group Sound and Physical Interaction Design. We can even conclude that human without technology is impossible. So that the technology plays a crucial role in our relationship with the world as well as in our relationship with the art. Today, I'm going to talk about our Alterity project. I would never imagine that someone would stand up and say that I do not like music. This is something we know. Music plays a very crucial role in our lives. It enters in, in our lives in from various different directions, and it's part of our social interaction. It has been a foundation of human culture for ages, and it's not a luxury, but it is a necessity for every human activity. And I don't think that anyone would come and correct me when I say that it will also continue uh, playing a crucial role in, the, in this continuous evolution of uh, human activities. Gary Tomlinson brings up a, a million year of span of the history of human musicking uh, with a specific focus uh, through complex social structure and advanced technologies. He brings up uh, uh, further characteristics that build a cultural knowledge uh, which exists in a loop between uh, technologies and musical practices. Perhaps the perspectives that we can drive from Tomlinson's viewpoint uh, is that in this one million year of span pan of human musicking, musicking has always been embedded in technologies that emerge as a result of an interrelations between humans and their environments. From almost equivalent uh, historical perspective, Don Aide introduces this ancient African Bushman uh, as the earliest musical instrument known to humans. It's simply a hunting bow that used as a, a single stringed uh, instrument on hands. And he illustrated uh, this image by himself. Uh, uh, you can see that a human using a bow without any arrow, but in a particular musical position, uh, wearing a sort of a, a shaman's animal skin. And the original uh, drawing is dated uh, 15,000 years before present from an ice age cave in France. So what we can 
drive from these two historical uh, perspectives is that there's something we know that hum music has always been a human activity. And we can also come up uh, with this uh, argument that music has always been related to technology as well. So music without technology almost impossible. In fact, there's something else that we know. Uh, technology mediates shapes and transforms our relationship with music. We do look at the music through the available technologies. We look at the music through electric guitar. Uh, there has been many compositions written for on this more And now we look at the music through a piece of code uh, written for audio uh, processing. And even now we look at the music uh, through an ancient machine. And it might just be valid today uh, when we uh, step into our studio or onto a stage or ahead of a keyboard synthesizer or a computer or a spot of an uh, unusual musical instrument. We've been always drawn into music through this relationship that actually also allows us to uh, understand uh, the musical actions that we create. Uh, in that sense, uh, this relationship is a, a very straightforward related to current technologies and it happens between digital musical instruments as embodied cultural objects and human bodies that inhabit and use them. In our sound and physical interaction uh, research group, in short, we call it SOPI, uh, we, are, we have been also reflecting such uh, viewpoints in our artistic uh, uh, research projects, critically reflecting our relationship uh, uh, with music in practice with building new musical instruments. For instance, current uh, research in artificial intelligence applied to music shows uh, a wider spectrum of interest in forming technologies and musical instruments that can be in one way alternative to human musicians or alternative to commonly practiced uh, musical instruments. And in our research uh, group, uh, through our research uh, artistic practices, in particular, we aim to expand our understanding on what we account for musicianship and musical instruments in this context with advanced technologies. Uh, well, we have been working on developing and building alterity musical instruments since last January. Uh, the name alterity is originated with Don Ide's alterity human technology relationship. And in this relationship, a, a, a alterity or the otherness is all about having its own objectives in an activity and a self-purpose with itself. In a, in a way, uh, having a life of its own. So we aim to reflect these uh, ideas in our project. Uh, alterity is a deformable, non-rigid musical instrument uh, that also comprises an audio synthesis module that is based on an artificial uh, model that uh, we have been working on in our research project. Um, so that uh, you can see that in the uh, image as well, it is like a closed shape, and so uh, the physical deformability and, and the manipulation of the handheld uh, uh, actions becomes the opening of this musical instrument. So what is really interesting uh, in this instrument is that it's sound synthesis module. So that we have been uh, using a particular uh, deep learning model that generates uh, new sounds uh, for real time in the moment of playing uh, uh, to be uh, processed in our uh, granular synthesis model uh, that we embedded in this instrument. So when the performer applies a handheld action uh, to the instrument, so the instrument monitors the interaction points and interaction rate and uses this uh, deep learning GAN model to generate a new sound and these audio samples are distributed in uh, different points on the instrument and uh, are ready to be processed uh, in audio synthesis module. Following the building and the practicing of this instrument, we composed a piece, Uncertainty, and this, uh, this composition idiomatically reflects this unusual behavior of this instrument. The composition uh, provides uh, similarly to its uh, surface in a way, a non-rigid 
but identifiable musical events followed by ever-shifting uh, sounds in timberscape. So uncertainty as well is nothing new. In, in particular, it's, it's, it can be called a particular state in, in art making process, uh, which opens up a new perspectives uh, of thoughts in art thinking. For instance, musicians would rather choose the instruments that uh, they are more familiar with or based on their uh, musical persona or, or, or their role in a, a particular composition. And with that, uh, they get in touch with the uh, physical and the psychological aspect of music musicianship in their very comfort zone. But if this could be taken further, so from a uh, uh, confident state to an uncertain state, this will also create a particular type of uh, relationship with unusual, unfamiliar musical instrument and the musician, and, and which could also result in a variety of uh, uh, unexpected creative outcomes. Perhaps the uh, close similarity uh, with this uh, composition could be found in Emily Giard's uh, Charest composition called Sofrir. Uh, uh, here, uh, the tuning is considered a very uh, uh, important act in the performance of this composition as the tuning of the cello has been uh, continuously modified and manipulated by another musician. So the sudden changes in the tuning also uh, puts uh, the performer in an uncertain state uh, during the performance. And in this state of uh, transformation from the confident to uncertainty, our relationship or, uh, with the instrument, which has been based on our previous relationship with the instrument, our musical experience or musical practice uh, uh, is very much uh, broken, uh, shaken, disturbed, and changed. Appearance of new sounds uh, with the new behavior of the instrument a change, and, and the behavior changes, the behavior changes in sonic space could allow performer to explore a whole new range of musical possibilities. So moreover, this could also turn into a continuous state of playing, reformulating our relationship and opening a variety of the different musical demands. Here I argue that uh, these advanced intelligence models applied on uh, audio synthesis level could allow us to explore uh, performing music uh, with uh, particular features that this defines the digital idiomaticity of the instrument and also allow us to reinvent the instrument in the act of music performance. AI models are appearing more in the audio synthesis level and these tools could open up new opportunities uh, uh, for the practices of music in uh, various different uh, communities. And at the same time, Applying these uh, technologies uh, in building and performing new musical instruments uh, brings in further questions and arguments for music practices. Uh, uh, for instance, what is to compose a musical piece for an instrument that already has its own musical objectives in the moment of uh, music performance? Or what does the idea that musical instrument have an independence existing uh, with its own history and with its own identity bring into a music making uh, experience. I believe that such further critical reflections could help us to affect the changes in our relationship with music and the world around us. Thank you. In certain conditions, certain uh, substances came together, and that potentially was the start of life on the planet. Liquid matter deals with protocells. Protocell is a term from science side. It is a droplet in a liquid, and scientists think that's very close to our cell, how human cell is formed. I'm playing as an artist with it. I take a petri dish. Usually I put in, in it a water bath and then I put oil based, but with a different chemistry, droplets in it. And they move 
many times I cannot control how they move. Oh, I'm also looking, oh my God, what is going on now? I think it is a metaphor for our time with uncertainty, uncontrollability, and this extreme aim for control, which we cannot obtain. It originates from the idea of evolution of the planet. They're quite small also to show in the arts. So I have been trying to develop things that one can extend them. I'm Laura Belov, I'm an artist, and at the moment also I work in Aalto University as an associate professor. I'm an experimental artist, so I work with art, science and technology. At the moment I'm showing liquids, but it might also concern environment or living matter technologies, hardcore robots and so on. 70% of our planet is liquid. So it is towards the ideas of merger of technology and biology, and in this case, biochemistry. I find all that very interesting, and that's of course how I see the future is coming. Today my talk is about liquids, and li liquid as a matter and also as a technology. I think liquid is a good metaphor for today's uh, world. Um, it also forces, as an artist, it forces you to think beyond the representation and go beyond or not to enforce the Cartesian split between body and mind or symbolic and real. So moist media was a term by Roy Ascot uh, in early zero zeros. And with this, he wanted to talk about the convergence of dry computational processes together with the biological wet processes. On the slide, you also see there's a two experiments of microbial fuel cells, which have uh, raised an interest of artists in recent years and even longer with scientists. So microbial fuel cell is a biological process which produces energy. So it combines computational processes with, with biology. Our planet is over 70% of water. And in 2016, scientists from NASA's propulsory um, laboratory, they noticed that this sort of a polar motion of, of our planet is shifting. And this is a, a phenomenon which has been noticed over 130 years. However, it's even longer what it has existed. Nevertheless, since zero zeros, the scientists say there's a big shift in this. And that is to do to the climate change and to the melting of Arctic ice. So all these changes inside the planet, but also on its surface with the weight distribution will affect. In the next few slides, I, I will show you a couple of examples from uh, historical, um, historical devices which use liquids. So these are computational devices. So the first one is quite well known. Uh, cybernetician uh, Gordon Pask was developing a, a, a chemical computer. And this was a, a platinum electrodes in a liquid. And, and the liquid was a ferrous sulfate. So when you put those in and you run a current through it, it starts accumulating. So in a way, it starts self-organizing and growing these kind of tentacles, what Pask also calls e uh, sort of a chemical ears and eyes of the system. Uh, the other side, you see an Austrian artist, uh, uh, Roman Kirchner, who made uh, a work based on this uh, Pask's computer or this idea. However, his work is actually making a sound installation. So similarly, there's a ferrosulfate uh, liquid and things grow, but the intensity of the connection between the environment and things self-organizing is producing sound. 
And it also is a cycle, so it has a passive phase where um, these then dissolve back to the liquids. Uh, this is a 1936 um, Russian scientist, Lukyanov, who was inventing a very interesting um, first water-based computer called Water Integrator. And this uh, was developed actually for uh, calculating partial differential equations, which were very difficult and laborious at the time to calculate. And the, the device was developed specific, specifically for uh, looking at the, uh, or calculating the cracking of concrete. So this required that you um, sort of calculated the material, material of the concrete, its curing process, and also environmental co uh, conditions where this was going on and how the cracks, or what was the potential of cracks coming more. And this was a very, very difficult um, calculation, but uh, this computer, which was built out of glass tubes and water plugs and valves in them, you could do that fairly quickly and fairly accurately. Uh, a second water-based computer was a little over 10 years uh, after the first one, 1949, and this was made by a New Zealander, um, Dr. Phillips, who was based in UK at the, at the time where he was doing research. And he, um, it is, first of all, it is considered that this, uh, this computer was based on the Lukianov's kind of model or idea. So this is looking at the national economy of UK. So it has all kinds of chambers and valves. And it's, one could say that with its complexity, it's almost uncomfortably uh, accurate image of today's economy. So you have the interests, you have the taxes, you have savings in different things. And when you sh shift uh, certain waters, you see how it affects the rest. Um, now, protocells. When I started looking into uh, liquids, I specifically got interested of the protocells. Um, and, and in the image, actually, you see some of the, some of the kind of simple, um, simple experiments I have been making as an, as an artist uh, and also trying to learn what do the scientists look in the protocells? How do they do it? What's the reason? And I've learned that different areas actually have investigated protocells from different perspectives. So there has been uh, biological people uh, who have been asking how did the, the life start on Earth? Could it be through the protocells? There have been uh, biochemists who have been talking recently about living machines. Uh, designers and architects have looked at it uh, as a self-organizing matter and, and so on. So, and yes, roboticists also have been interested of this idea of nanorobots or even bigger, but uh, liquid-based. So protocell. Protocell is a spherical lipid system, uh, according to the scientist. And um, it has had the area of development has had two uh, terms, artificial chemical life and wet artificial life. And these both terms make a clear connection to the today's artificial life uh, sort of our development, which I find very interesting. Um, protocells have been considered as a kind of a synthetic evolution by many uh, scientists. Once, uh, one you see on the on the slide by Lee Croning in the Croning Labs in UK has been proposing uh, also a robotic system that can aid a sort of a self-organized synthetic evolution. Here I show you just a quick list on, on historical names. So this area in sciences has actually a history of 100 years. 
And here you see some of the names. I'm not going to go into them, but I just mentioned that, for example, the Soviet, Soviet um, uh, scientist uh, Oparin was quite famous for his uh, book, Origin of Life, in 1920s, where he proposed the idea and actually also uh, pushed for a debate with vitalists that maybe the life started with the very simple biochemical systems where in certain situations they came together and made the favorable conditions for life. Uh, here I show you quite recent research uh, from Trento University. And this is a Sylvia Hall, a young researcher who have made a protocell research with the idea that you can transport things. So in the first clip, you see that there's a, this kind of small line inside the droplet, and it's a small metal wire. And the idea here is that the droplet could leave the wire and go away. So it's sort of a transported. In the second clip, where you see the two droplets, they have a tiny capsules. And this was a little bit more challenging because those capsules had a biological life in them. So they had living bacteria. And the idea was here, again, the transportation. And then they were checking if the bacteria still lives because uh, the environment here is very toxic for, for living bacteria. Here I show you two artworks uh, which have dealt. So Adam Brown and uh, Robert Ruth Bernstein uh, have made the kind of a origins of life free biogene system. And in that you see several uh, uh, vessels and in each vessel is from history a set of uh, chemistry which potentially could create protocells or semi-living uh, systems. Uh, in the other side, you see uh, Rachel Armstrong and Philip Beasley's uh, system where they had uh, these kind of incubators for protocells. And these incubators were actually connected to the Venice Lagoon. So there was this idea that, as we know, the Venice is sinking. Could that be potentially somehow saved with the protocell systems as a kind of robot bringing in certain ingredients. Here's an image of one of my uh, uh, works or experiments from a couple of years ago. And this was done together with Stavros Didakis. And then we had a bigger installation with several people involved in it. And the idea here was to have a biochemical life and digital life sort of are overlapping. And the robot you see there in the, one of the images is a kind of a hanging robot. The idea was that the robot is a mad scientist. And it, it fostered few different potentials for life. And one of them was this uh, protocell or this biochemistry. Others were more kind of robotic systems and so on. And in this uh, work, this is from earlier this year, uh, I made a little bit different installation. In the previous one, you see people could observe, OK, what is this fostering? But here, actually, the audience was offered the possibility to mix their own chemical soup. So it's a very simple system where you had the bottles and you could decide, OK, I put this. Of course, I had designed what is in the, in the bottles and how the system, system works. But the idea was here also to push the ideas that what is life and how would you think if there would emerge life, if you are the creator of life? How would that make you feel? This was uh, shown in, in Slovenia earlier this year. And this is my last slide. And I wanted to put the well-known slogan by Christopher Langton from 1989. And he was the father of the academic field of artificial life. So not life as we know it, but life as it could be. And even if he came from computer science and related to the computer science, I think it's actually even more fitting for today's world with biotechnologies, biochemistry, and this extreme desire we have as humans to control life. Thanks.
huge areas of blue algae in the middle of the sea. People don't realize that out at sea there are these massive areas where you just sail through for you know, hours and it's just horrific. Welcome to Godzilla. Uh, Godzilla is a 42-foot Warum Pahi catamaran. We have owned Godzilla uh, for about 15 years and have been sailing a lot around the Baltic Sea. And during that time, we've seen the uh, effects of the pollution in, in the environment. We started thinking, like, what could we do about it? And Having this sort of boat, we realized that this could become a platform for a sort of multitude of artists uh, and researchers to use uh, for their own projects. Well, our hope is to create a network around the Baltic Sea. That means a network with sort of artist residency centers and scientific research centers where the boat can visit and while the boat is in these various places both local and international artists will come and do projects but also because Godzilla is quite eye-catching you know it's like unusual we hope to use that as a way to attract the maybe boating public and or other public to the works so that it can become a sort of dissemination platform we chose the name Godzilla for the boat because she appeared, at least in, in the Finnish context, as like this sort of monster. And I've always thought that Godzilla is like a, a friendly monster. And you could maybe imagine you know, some of these industries as these monsters, these threats to the sea. I think the very unique nature of Godzilla means that when you're on the boat you have a, a different type of relationship with the, the sea. So my name is Andy Best, I'm a lecturer in sculpture in the transdisciplinary art studies part of Aalto University. Well, hello, and welcome to Imagining Godzilla. Imagining Godzilla is an art, science, residency, and network platform hosted on our Warham-designed Pahi 42 sailing catamaran. As you can see from the, uh, from the photo of the boat here, and this was taken uh, by Tivon Rice during last year's residency. Uh, Godzilla is a Polynesian style uh, catamaran and uh, very suitable for doing work close to the ocean. James Warham himself was a pioneer of catamaran sailing. He was the first uh, European to sail across the Atlantic uh, in a catamaran, and as you can see from this boat, his first, uh, he was very heavily influenced by Polynesian designs and the uh, idea that they had traveled the oceans uh, hundreds of years before the Westerners. Our idea with the residency platform is to help bring attention to the Baltic Sea and the ecological one might say, catastrophe that it is facing. Here we see the uh, Carta Marina uh, from 1539, uh, which illustrates the whole of uh, Scandinavia and part of the North Sea. Uh, and here we see the Baltic Sea taken by uh, the Copernicus Sentinel uh, satellite uh, just a couple of years ago. I think it's very important to think about how uh, the artist's vision can be used in a positive way to affect how 
uh, the public and politicians um, think about the nature and their surroundings. One of the major uh, issues facing the Baltic Sea is eutrophication, or rather the growth of algae uh, due to pollution, uh, particularly due to uh, phosphates and nitrogen in uh, agricultural fertilizers that run off. Uh, the Baltic Sea is one of the, well, has been one of the most polluted seas in the world. And it is also particularly unique because it is very, very uh, fresh water. It's sort of brackish water, so not like pure seawater, but uh, largely uh, a mixture of, of fresh water and also very shallow. And when it is surrounded by very populated areas, uh, as it is, and with lots of rivers running into it, this means that it's a recipe for a very difficult uh, situation for this uh, eutrophication. This was one of the things that uh, Maria Pustinen and myself have really had at heart when we started the Imagining Godzilla project. Because we have seen over the years sailing in the Baltic these huge areas of uh, blue algae that blossom and bloom during the summer months. And often they are far away from the coastline. They are right out at sea, kilometers and kilometers of this green algae uh, on the sea surface. It only seems to get into the public's attention when these algae comes ashore, when the uh, archipelago and beaches are affected. We also see in the Baltic a very, very heavy uh, density of shipping traffic. Uh, not only is the traffic itself uh, polluting, it's the way these ships treat uh, the water. As you can see in this image, uh, a tanker just discharging water from its tanks uh, into the, the port in uh, Klaipeda. Uh, but also the, the risks of collision uh, to Russian ports. There are a huge number of oil tankers, many of which are maybe not up to the latest specifications. And so the chances of an oil catastrophe are very large as well. Here you can see in the image a, a satellite image of the blue algae and a ship uh, making its way through that uh, through that algae. And of course, when you're on sea level, uh, you don't see this, uh, the huge extent of it, but um, you just see this sort of green uh, mass around you. But really, from the satellite, you start to understand uh, the extent of this problem. Now, as I stated, the, uh, we see that artists working closely with uh, scientists and then closely in relation to the, uh, the water itself, have a great chance to use their visual skills to create new ways of looking at the sea. And as you can see from these uh, charts and maps, uh, what we maybe observe and what we draw is not necessarily exactly the same as what is on the, uh, you know, in front of us physically. And of course, in the, in the past, uh, people used their own physical experiences rather than satellite imagery or other forms of data collection. And I think it's very interesting to see how over the years these charts uh, affect uh, the ways that we think about this, uh, this area. The other, uh, of course, real important fact about the Baltic Sea is that during the centuries, it has been also the focus of a lot of uh, political struggle uh, between Sweden and Russia, 
between Russia and, or the Soviet Union and the West, uh, and now between Russia and NATO. Uh, and this is always developing and also affects both uh, the environment and also commerce. So this visual information about the sea is also an area where artists can uh, affect and use their skills and knowledge to reveal truths or alternative uh, ways of looking at the, uh, the current situations. I mentioned earlier about the vast amount of shipping, and here you can see in this image the, uh, the routes that the current uh, cargo ships are taking uh, around the, the Baltic and how they are very much like sort of super highways uh, across the sea. What is also uh, not immediately in everybody's minds is what is under the sea. And last year in the uh, residency, Samir Bomik uh, was working with the idea of looking at the pipelines and cables under the sea. And here is a, a chart of uh, the Nord Stream pipes uh, and planned position uh, in the uh, Gulf of Finland. So with Imagining Godzilla, we want to bring artists, uh, as I said, in close contact with the sea, allow them to use their ways of working to touch physically and mentally to the sea and see what comes out of that. There is not the intention to make propaganda about the environment, but rather to use poetry, visual imagery, uh, performance, however the artists themselves develop their ideas, to highlight then the problems and hopefully the solutions to the Baltic Sea uh, pollution problems. Gary Markle, who is a Canadian artist uh, working with fashion, created this selkie skin. So using the uh, traditional stories and, uh, about the selkie, uh, a creature that is like half seal, half human, uh, and use that as the starting point for creating um, costume made from rubbish found on the beaches. And you can see in this image that he is really also imagining, experiencing what it is like to be at one with the sea. And here is uh, Andrew Patterson, another artist from last year's residency, uh, also experiencing using the selkie skin with Godzilla in the background. So we have to think, how can uh, our artist project, this imagining Godzilla, use all, uh, all the possible um, routes and opportunities to really highlight the problems and solutions to the Baltic Sea uh, environmental crisis. Of course, the name Godzilla conjures up this crazy sci-fi sci monster. But Godzilla also can be a positive force. It's not just destructive. And we can also think that is the Godzilla in the name the, the sea? Or is it the uh, crisis? Or is it the boat and the people? And I think all of these things are true in some way. So I would really say that um, we are looking forward to future years when we can 
carry on this project, uh, work with diverse artists from all fields, uh, and we are looking for uh, interesting uh, proposals from, from all disciplines. So if you are interested, please be in touch with us. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the Baltic Sea and imagining a better future for that sea. To conclude, I would like to play for you a poem uh, created by Eva Macalli, who is an Italian sound artist from, uh, and she created this last year during the residency. I can change the name, the change, can I? How do you do, you do how? The change has a name, has a change the. There is only love, only is there. There is only love, only is there. Underwater Godzilla is saying, is Godzilla underwater? I need peace that is space. I need peace at a fast pace. Rahwa, Rahwa, Rahwa. <laughs>